In this episode, Pages of History, the attack on Schweinfurt that should have ended the war, tactics and strategy, sideslip shooting, an insidious trick for all you air duelists, and Metal Beasts, the long-awaited heavyweight tank, the T-72A. Meet the new Soviet top tank representing the most mass-produced line of MBTs in the world, the T-72. This machine was added in Update 1.85, placed at BR 9.3, and can be researched right after you appear at Tier 6. Once again, you just got a top tank that you can get without wading through the whole line of T-64s. Essentially, the T-72 is a simplified version of the late T-64s that inherited both pros and cons of the Soviet MBTs. Let's take a closer look. The first thing to notice is a nice low profile, a powerful 125mm smoothbore weapon, and an NSVT Uteos AA machine gun. Inside, this tank is powered by a 780 horsepower engine. The composite armor of the machine consists of rolled homogeneous plates and textolite that altogether cover three crew members, two in the turret and one in the hull. Next to them, there is a carousel ammo rack and the autoloader that allowed for making the tank considerably lighter and ditching one crew member. Overall, this machine is very durable. Its upper glacy plate can take a punch from the XM1, the Abrams, and default APFSDS shells of the Leopard 2. And that's something quite extraordinary for this BR. The turret's front can survive almost any AP shell presented in the game, and when you research the whole of this tank, you can buy its 1983 modification with an additional 16mm armor layer on the upper glacy plate that gives you some extra survivability. Still, this machine is not invincible. Its huge lower glacy plate has no composite armor. Any anti-tank shell will pierce it easily. Another weak spot is the low neck on the upper glacy plate. All this adds some restrictions to your tactical choices. When possible, you need to hide the lower glacy plate and turn your turret's cheek during your opponent's fire so that he can't break your breach. The T-72A also has a smoke grenade launcher as well as an additional 12.7mm machine gun. The first one will come in handy to safely regroup when you're outnumbered, and the second one will protect you from the helicopters and some of the other light-armoured air and ground tech. As for speed, this tank isn't much faster than the T-64, and it's much slower than its American and German rivals on this tier. It drives only 4 kph backwards, which means no swing shots and no fast retreats. So how do you thrive on the T-72A? Because of your speed, you'll never be the first to get to the front line. But you don't have to. Be creative. Find, a, let's say, a sponsor on a faster machine and follow him watching his back and overall helping during his fights. You'll get your well-deserved frags and your teammate a well-timed support, which is always handy when you try to breach the enemy flank. And if you like a good urban close combat or play arcade mode, keep in mind that you've got a devastatingly powerful HE shell piercing the whole 47 millimeters of armor. Even if you don't get a one-shot kill with this one, you'll at least break your opponent's weapon and win some time to finish the job with a second punch. In all other cases, the T-72A is a usual Soviet MBT. Not very fast, with mediocre elevation angles, but very well armed, durable and small. It's most effective as a support tank, and it's quite great when you use it right. Take a look. This is Its Majesty Bearing. Nowadays, it's a very cheap product that is produced in millions daily. But the participants of World War II 
couldn't even dream about such things. Back then, bearings were very expensive and took a lot of effort and time to make. And boy, were they important. Any traffic center, aircraft, tank, or any other engineering factory, shipyards, oil refinery systems, power plants, everywhere they needed a mind-blowing amount of these priceless bearings. No wonder that the U.S. Air Force Command considered the enemy bearing plants to be the most important targets to attack. They thought that the war would be over the second they took as many flying fortresses as they could find in Europe and bombed the main bearing plant in Germany. That was situated in a picturesque Bavarian town called Schweinfurt. In the morning of August 17, 1943, hundreds of American bombers took off to the skies. To distract the Luftwaffe fighters, they planned to attack a Messerschmitt factory in Regensburg first. And when the Germans would be out of fuel, they planned to bomb the main target. But the German Air Defense Command cracked this puzzle as soon as the first flying fortresses had crossed the English Channel. Moreover, neither the British Spitfires nor the American Thunderbolts had enough flight range to accompany the bombers all the way. And the second the Allied fighters left them and flew home, the flying fortresses wound up in hell. Hundreds of Messerschmitts and Focke-Wolfs lashed out at the defenseless bombers. The Luftwaffe pilots even had to wait in line for an attack. They were also supported by numerous AA guns on the ground. Those American pilots who survived that day remembered that the cockpits were filled with the choky powder fumes that wouldn't dissipate, despite the numerous holes in the fuselage. Taking enormous casualties, the Allies managed to battle their way to Schweinfurt and turn the whole place along with its bearing plants into a pile of burning smithereens. At that moment, it was the biggest bombing in history. There were 376 B-17s participating in this mission, and they only lost 60 of those in the air. The same number of aircraft were disqualified upon returning to bases. The US lost more four-engine bombers in a single day than the USSR assembled during the whole war. Hundreds of US pilots died, went missing in action, or got captured. They lost months to train new ones and had to cease inland bombing missions until autumn. Of course, the war wasn't over. But the rice industry suffered colossal damage. Almost all sectors, first and foremost the aircraft factories, had more than a third of the needed numbers of bearings cut. The Germans had to quickly disperse a lot of enterprises, mask them, break into smaller pieces and less effective parts. Many R&D facilities were simply shut down. Germany suffered a dramatic reduction in making new engines for the Focke Wolf 190 fighters, and the Schweinfurt factory could only be completely rebuilt after the war. So, if you find a bearing lying somewhere in the dust, pick it up and warm it in your hands. Now you know the true value of this little thing. Sideslip shooting is a very useful trick that can help you tweak your chances in an air duel without causing suspicion. Some of you might hear the term for the first time, so we'll start by going through the basics. The simplest way to attack an enemy is in a frontal assault. You get closer to your opponent and both open fire, but both of you have a 50-50 chance of surviving and succeeding. Obviously, if you want to increase your chances of winning, you have to maneuver somehow to confuse your adversary's aiming but keep your own as sharp as possible. Let's try using our ailerons, A and D buttons, while aiming with your mouse at the spot where the enemy will get in a couple of seconds. See what's happening? The rudder tries to return the machine to horizontal flight, which makes it sort of slide. In simulation battles, this maneuver is a lot trickier, as you'll need to use a couple of other control elements as well. But in RB, you'll be fine, with your mouse and a couple of keys. If you sideslip, you can easily trick an inexperienced opponent, making him aim with a wrong deflection. As a result, your enemy's bullets will pass you by. Maybe if he's lucky, they'll clip your wing a bit. 
Of course, somebody more experienced will figure you out in no time. To make his life harder, don't just sideslip in the same direction. Bank from one wing to the other. Break the trajectory and go back to sideslipping again. The point of all this dancing is the same, to constantly confuse your opponent while getting closer to him. But let's finish with the theory and take a look at this example. First contact, at about two kilometers, open fire. Then sharply change course, like this, and go back to flying straight to the enemy. Start side-slipping at about one and a half or one kilometer from him and change the slip direction in a couple of seconds. The main ingredient of your success now is sharpshooting at large distances. But this maneuver isn't for all aircraft to perform. If you take, say, the Fokker Wolf 190, its rudder won't be quick enough to turn you back to the opponent. Choose planes with effective rudders, weaponized wings, and as big a one-second burst mass as possible. If the guns are located in the V of the engine or somewhere close to it, it will be a bit harder, but still manageable after some training exercises. And the last piece of advice. Use stealth belts, or the enemy can figure out your maneuver by looking at the traces from your bullets. Good hunting! Thank you everyone so much for your comments. Of course, we can't answer all of them in the shooting range. And some of them we just can't reveal before it's time, even though we really want to. Just know that we read every comment and we're extremely grateful for your gratitudes, your criticism and your ideas. The first question comes from André Vialpando. You should do a tank trial comparing all the reserve vehicles. The same idea also comes from Gianluca Copatino and Scrivo Inonavn. Great minds think alike. We will definitely do such a trial in the nearest future. Okay, maybe not the nearest, but soon anyway. Thanks for the cool idea. Ifty Carrot writes, Compare all the heavy assault vehicles from each nation. A-39 Tortoise, AMX-54, Jag Tiger, D-95, and Hori Production. Well, it seems you liked our test drive section, guys. That means we will continue doing other test drives and compare different tech in the field. This idea also gets into production. Then there's a question from your average Komnusit. G'day, I'm an avid player of the German tech tree and wondering if there was an easy way to destroy both the Tiger II, H, and the Tiger II, P, using the Tiger H1 and Panther D. Cheers, mate. Hi there, mate. To effectively pierce the Tiger II P with your APCBCs, both of these tanks need to aim at its turret's cheeks, to the right and left of the weapon. A good shot might not destroy the opponent instantly, but it surely will make him helpless. As far as the Tiger II H, its turret front is a lot more durable, and even the Panther D can hardly pierce it. The Tiger H1 has no chance against this protection. You'll have to shoot the target in the side. The next message is from Calbreno. Could you give a little more attention to Naval, please? I think they're starting to get a bit lonely. You know what, mate? We thought so too. We'll try paying more attention to the Naval forces in the upcoming episodes. Another question is sent in from a player called Mateus Mariano. What about pages of history for Brazilian fighters? You know, Italian theater, Battle of Monte Castello, etc. Hi there. Thanks for the idea, chum. We'll save it in our special notebook with all the suggestions for the next historical topics. Someday, we will get to tell you this story as well. And the last, very serious message comes from Dijon Sinani. This is better than watching TV. Hi there, Dijon. Isn't almost everything better than watching TV? Still, thanks for your support. Well, that's it for today. This was The Shooting Range by Gaijin Entertainment. Thank you for all the kind words that you've met the reboot of our show with, as well as for all the useful criticism. Subscribe to the channel to be the first to watch the next episodes of The Renewed Shooting Range. 
click the bell, like, and leave your thoughts in the comments below. See you in a week.